Good morning, everyone. This is Arts Beat Radio here on 89.5 FM WSKB. I'm Mark Auerbach here in the studio this morning with Peter Coles before the snow arrives. We've got a great show for you. And leading right in, we'll be talking with Theater Works director Eric Ort. And uh, Theater Works has an opening night tomorrow night of a play called The Legend of Georgia McBride. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Mark. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Um, first of all, tell people about this play. I know that the word of mouth on it is really terrific because a lot of people that I know attend preview performances at Theater Works, and they keep saying to me, you are really going to like this show a lot. So um, what's it all about? Well, Mark, first of all, I'm, I'm delighted that the word of mouth is out there because the show is so much fun. So we, uh, The Legend of Georgia McBride is the story of Casey, who is an Elvis impersonator in a dive bar in the Florida Panhandle. And on the day that he and his wife learn that they're going to have their first baby, he gets fired because his Elvis act isn't bringing in the audiences they need, and his, the bar owner brings in a couple of drag queens and turns his bar into a drag bar. And um, under a set of circumstances, Casey has to eventually go out and start performing in drag. And so it's his story of how he grapples with that as a way of supporting his family. Well, is it a play with music? I mean, there's a lot of um, choreography and a lot of performance as part of it, right? Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the fun of the show comes from two things. One, it's, it's brilliantly written, and I, I know we'll talk about Matthew Lopez, but um, the, the other great fun of it is there are all these drag numbers in it, especially this one montage as Casey's trying to figure out who his drag persona is uh, with, with terrific music in it. Um, uh, from Judy Garland to Loretta Lynn and Reba McIntyre. Um, it's, it's just the, the, the drag is, uh, it's both hysterical and, um, and so much fun to watch. I learned as I was doing research for writing a story about the play that Jim Parsons from The Big Bang Theory has optioned the film version of it and that mm -hmm. the playwright, Matthew Lopez, um, is a real up-and-coming uh, playwright and his previous play Reverberations had its world premiere at Hartford Stage, um, but the Legend of Georgia McBride has been around for a while, I believe. Um, how did you guys? How did you guys discover the play? Well, you know, it's been something that Rob, uh, so Rob Ruggiero, our producing artistic director, who's actually directed the Legend of Georgia McBride. Um, with the kind of precision that he brings to the musicals he's direct and the kind of heart that he brings to the, uh, the plays, the dramas that he directs. But it's been something that's been on Rob's to-do list for, gosh, probably about three years now. And um, given how much music is in it, I, I think Rob was uh, kind of using next to normal to test the waters a little. You know, how much do theater work subscribers and uh, folks in the area want to see that much music in a theater work show. And uh, Next to Normal proves that if the story's good, people people want to come out for a musical. Now, so, uh, so now seems like the year to do it. And um, in, in terms of, of the subject matter of the show of drag as entertainment, uh, Rob Ruggiero directed La Cacio Full at Goodspeed, which is probably one of the funniest musicals of all time. And it does feature in its starring role um, a drag performer who's also a parent. And um, I guess the choreographer from his production of La Cage choreographed the legend of Georgia McBride and also his one of his stars from Lacage at Goodspeed is also in the legend of Georgia McBride. Absolutely. Yeah. Jameson Stern, who played the role of Alban and Zaza at the Good, in the Goodspeed production of Lacage, is, uh, is in Georgia McBride. We are thrilled to have him. And uh, he is playing the pivotal role of Miss Tracy Mills, who is the, um, 
the the drag queen who the cousin of the bar owner who comes in and helps help save the bar. She and her her friend uh, uh, Miss Anorexia Nervosa uh, come to, to <laughs> save the bar. I, I, affectionately known as Rexy. I love that name. I, what what a great name for a drag queen, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what is the what is the audience response been so far? Are they um, shocked a little bit, or are they totally into it? You know, Mark, it's a, uh, it's, it's been so much fun in the theater. We um, so it's a comedy. It's got these drag numbers. The drag numbers are a little loud. Okay, you know they they have to fill the space. Um, the, the performers are lip syncing the music, which is the, the standard in drag. And so I think we were a little nervous about whether it would just be too loud and garish a show for, for audiences. And I kid you not, the Sunday matinee three days ago, just they were, they were eating out of the performers' hands. They were having such a great time, really from the get-go. From the moment Casey appears first as Elvis, uh, the audience was was laughing and applauding and and just having a ball. Yeah, I guess Theater Works has really been riding this crest of shows that have been so appealing in the last couple of years. I mean, I know Next to Normal, which was about a year ago, what, uh, was a musical that get extended and held over. And ever since the 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 plays, each one is is more exciting than the next. So, um, how how do you find the plays and what happens after the uh, legend of Georgia McBride? Because your season goes on into the summer. It does. Yeah. Well, again, Mark, thanks. We're, we're thrilled with the way the, this season is going. Um, and I, I love to hear you say that, that you feel like they've been building each time. We've, I feel like we've also been challenging our audiences a little bit. Um, Constellations had a, an, untraditional structure to it that that was something that really you had to be there for the show and and engaged but um uh how we find our pieces it's it's a little bit of word of mouth it's a little bit of watching what's going on off broadway in new york it's a little bit of uh agents literary agents sending scripts to us uh rob uh working his network what 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 have you done recently what what's exciting um and what's exciting for us next at Theater Works, the next show in our season, is The Invisible Hand by Ayad Akhtar, who is the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright of uh, Disgrace. And, um, and we are very happy that David Kennedy, who directed the Westport Country Playhouse's very successful production last year of The Invisible Hand, is, is going to be with us. For our production. Now, bef- before I ask you another million questions in the brief time that we have, let's tell people that uh, The Legend of Georgia McBride runs through April 22nd. And if you're Correct. interested in getting information about Theatre Works while we're chatting or afterwards, it's theaterworkshartford.org. Eric, um, one of America's most famous drag entertainers is doing a benefit performance for you guys this weekend. Ah. And that's the infamous Varla Jean Merman. And Correct. I, I was thinking when I realized that Varla Jean was going to perform at Theater Works, how much that drag entertainment has been a part of American culture over the last 30 years with La Cage aux Faux on Broadway in the mid-1980s to RuPaul's Drag Race on television. Um, drag is really entertaining. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's, well, <laughs> uh, for, for some of the, I'm, I'm thinking of Georgia McBride now in the story, so for some of the characters, yes, it's about entertainment. It's about uh, business, in the case of Eddie, the bar owner. Um, but there's also a really remarkable moment where uh, Rexy um, talks about what drag is as uh, a political statement. And it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful moment um, uh, uh, that, that reminds everyone that drag as 
as much as it's coming into the mainstream on your television set, um, you know, grew as a subversive uh, way of, of having a voice for, for voiceless people. So it's, it's, it's a show that also has a really interesting kind of sneaky conscience to it, too. Well, I think that makes that makes for good theater when you sit there and you laugh, but you walk away with something afterwards that makes you think or is a little bit provocative or makes you wonder and ask questions. That's what good theater is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the beauty of the show, too, is that we are following Casey's story and and it's his discovery of this joy of performing as Georgia is really is the journey and, and what that means for him as a person, for him as a young artist, uh, for him as a father and a husband. So it's, uh, it's really, it, it's funny, but it's got a, a really heart to it. Let me ask another question here. I mean, you've, you're riding a crest of a really good season of diverse and different types of plays, uh, which started with The Wolves, which you directed in the fall. I understand that Theater Works recently got a grant, um, a major grant, actually, and you're going to be doing some renovations and updates and all of that to your building. We are. We are. Our, our board and... Uh, Rob has been in the planning stages for, gosh, I think it's probably about three years now, maybe even longer. But um, to, uh, well, let me take a step back. We are very fortunate in that TheaterWorks owns the City Arts on Pearl building at 233 Pearl Street in Hartford. Um, it was a very wise investment that the, the theater made uh, probably two decades ago or so. And, um, but it's a 1927 building. So the systems are, you know, a little old. So part of this project is to to look at the building overall. But I think for our patrons, the most exciting thing about it is that um, that the, we're going to give a little attention to the theater itself to just give us that much more ability in that small space to produce the the most um, provocative, um, beautiful high production value shows that we can in there. So there's some things that are specifically addressing the patron experience where as most theaters do when they renovate, expanding the bathroom, making sure we have enough, um, but also uh, raising the lighting grid in the space. Uh, it's, a, it's a small space, but we believe we can gain about a foot to 18 inches in our lighting grid, which is just enough to give a little more um, uh, more options to our lighting designers, and I think audiences will also ultimately see the difference. So, in so it's the an exciting project. In the previous play, Constellations, um, you kind of reimagined the theater and made it almost a theater in the round. Um, yeah. How did that work, ultimately? Uh, is there an opportunity now, now that you've tried it, that you may stage other plays in different ways in that space? Uh, well, first of all, the staging constellations in the round was, uh, was really a remarkable experience. I think it was a treat for audiences to think about theater work in a different way, and um, one of the objectives of the set designer was to disorient people a little bit before coming into this show that, again, had a, a nonlinear structure. And uh, I think she was very successful at that. And, um, and, and we got a, a lot of positive feedback on seeing the space in a different way. In, in terms of the renovation, uh, the footprint of the stage space and the seating space will remain the same. Uh, we hope that we might have the flexibility to be able to do really creative uh, reimaginings of the space, but it's not necessarily an inherent part of the, uh, of the project. 
And um, theater works. You have a, a gallery area as well when you when you walk into the building and stuff. But what's in the rest of the building besides the theater and the gallery and the box office area? Well, for for anyone who's been to the theater, they know that uh, on that first floor, the the building mezzanine or building lobby, um, we are very lucky to have uh, a number of tenants. There and it are, it, they are the recruiting offices for the four branches of the U.S. military, uh, who are very reliable tenants and good good neighbors for us. And uh, on the third floor of the building, we have other arts organizations uh, and artists who are tenants in the building as well. And uh, the Theater Works and City Arts on Pearl are, are very happy to be able to uh, lease those office spaces at uh, below market to some of our uh, fellow arts organizations and and really be a hub for uh, other organizations and artists. It's a, it's a real treat. So as we, as we go into this renovation, which uh, I would be remiss to not say that uh, we are, were very lucky to have received a, a generous um, grant from the State Bonding Commission, which is really helping us do this work and uh, generous support from uh, a handful of, of um, individual donors to let us dig into this project. How many, uh, I, I know that when Theater Works does a show, you can't depend solely on box office revenues. Um, how many donors do you have to Theater Works? Because you do a lot of really good stuff on a small budget. Well, thanks. Yes, we uh, we really are proud of, of the production values uh, at our theater, and um, Mark, I, I don't know the exact figure, but we are we are really uh, on, on the one hand, we're really lucky that uh, we do get support from our subscribers and single ticket buyers. Uh, but what I what I do know anecdotally is that it's really just a fraction of the people who actually come through Theater Works each year who who make that connection that. This isn't a commercial venture. This isn't like uh, going to a Broadway show that we are indeed a nonprofit and that ticket sales themselves only cover uh, a fraction of, of the actual cost of putting up a show. So we're always trying to get that message out, and we're always grateful for anyone who uh, takes the time to uh, support, support us as a, as a nonprofit. Eric, before you run off to rehearsal, I have a question for you. The very funny um, playwright Jacques Lamar uh, has done works at Theater Works before. And last summer, uh, uh, Theater Works did the world premiere of his play Raging Skillet, which is a food-based show. I understand that um, he's in town and he's going to be doing a benefit uh, at the Mark Twain House, which you're moderating where the three muses of his three plays about food are gathered together and food will be served as part of it. Uh, what's your role in this entire thing? Well, I was, I was uh, delighted when Jacques got in touch with me and asked me if I'd be willing to moderate it because, uh, well, first of all, I'll, I will have no uh, role to do it all because all of the people who are going to be on that stage uh, talking about food and theater and art uh, don't need somebody to moderate. They are going to be brilliant together. Um, so it should, it should be a lot of fun. And uh, if it, there are two things everyone should put on their calendars in addition to Georgia McBride. Uh, it would be coming to the Mark Twain House on Wednesday the 18th of April for this panel discussion. And then for those who really do want a deep dive into drag to, to join us at Theater Works this coming Sunday, March 25th, for the Varla Jean that you made reference to. And, and Jacques Lamar has written a lot of Varla Jean Merman's material. I, I've noticed when I've watched some of her videos on YouTube, uh, it says, you know, written by Jacques Lamar. So, Absolutely, yeah. Jacques was the, the co-author uh, with Jeffrey, who is the um, non-drag half of uh, Varla Jean's personality. Uh, they were the co-writers of, of this piece. That, that will be at Theater Works on the 25th. 
Well, that show is called Bad Heroin, and um, the show at TheaterWorks right now is called The Legend of Georgia McBride. It runs through April 22nd. Tickets and information for everything we talked about this morning is available at theaterworkshartford.org. Eric Gort, thanks for joining us this morning. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Mark, thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here to thank our underwriters. When we come back, we'll be talking with the author Jean Yoakum and her book, The Self-Employment G- Survival Guide. I had Jean on the Westfield News show last week, and she really had a lot of good advice. And today we're going to kind of narrow it in for some of you self-employed artists and dancers and choreographers and poets and actors and writers and all of that good stuff. And later on in the program, we'll be meeting Meredith Atkinson from Playhouse on Park in West Hartford, talking about some of their upcoming productions. You're listening to 89.5 FM WSKB. This is Arts Beat Radio, and we'll be right back. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Commercial Distributing Company of Westfield. Now in its third generation of family ownership, Commercial is one of the premier beverage distributors of Western Massachusetts. The Playsick family and the staff of Commercial Distributing wishes you good times throughout the year and urges you to drink responsibly. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Comcast and Xfinity.com. With the Xfinity Double Play and Xfinity Triple Play, you can choose to bundle Comcast services for a great value. Experience Xfinity TV, Internet, home phone, and home security services. Explore all that Xfinity has to offer in the Westfield area on the web at Xfinity.com. We thank the generosity of our underwriters. For more information, please contact the Westfield State Foundation at 413-572-8646. Friday mornings is something different on 89.5 FM. It's JP's Talk About Town. Community Radio. 89.5 WSKB. Live from the campus of Westfield State University, this is 89.5 FM WSKB Westfield. Welcome back, everyone, to Arts Beat Radio here on 89.5 FM WSKB. I'm Mark Auerbach. Don't forget to tune into Arts Beat Radio on uh Wednesday, April 18th, we'll be having Chris Roman talking about the new play, musical play Tartuffe, opening the Silverthorne Theater. We'll be having Paul Marte from the Bushnell talking about the Bushnell's upcoming Broadway series, which includes Hamilton, which people have been waiting for for a long Ooh. time. And we'll be talking with Ilona Samagi, who's the costume designer for the Will Rogers Follies, which opens the Goodspeed season. So April showers will bring. April Arts Beat and some really cool guests. And if you're listening tomorrow morning on the Westfield News Show, I'll be standing in for Patrick Barry. And for an entire two-hour show, we're going to be talking with the good people from the Berkshire Theater Group. They are celebrating their 90th season opening this summer, and they've got a great lineup. We'll be talking with uh, Kate McGuire, who is the CEO, and, and about the history a little bit about the Berkshire Theater Group, because 90 years is a milestone of theaters here in Western Massachusetts and Western New England. And we'll be talking with Travis Daly, who's going to direct Tarzan at the Colonial Theater this summer, and Daisy Walker, who's going to direct a revival of Hair at the Unicorn Theater, which is all part of the Berkshire Theater Group. That's tomorrow from 6 to 8 here on 89.5 FM WSKB. Peter Coles is a newly blonde man, and he's here in the studio engineering, and Gene Yoakum's on the phone. Good morning, Gene. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm good. Uh, thanks for sending another nor'easter up our way. Um, well, thought, it's snowing here, too. I thought it was going to be spring today, but I guess not. No, we have, well, we're heading towards an inch of the snow on the ground here in Durham, North Carolina. And, of course, that brings everything to a screeching halt. Uh, fortunately, it's not sticking to the road, so I think people will be okay. Last week, we had a chance to chat on the Westfield News Show, and uh, there was a lot of people responded, and they said that you offered a lot of good advice with your book, The Self-Employment Survival Guide, which comes out on the um, 
Roman and Littlefield uh, imprint uh, April 8th, which is just around the corner. So I thought I'd have you back today on Arts Beat Radio to talk a little bit about self-employment strategies, because most people that are in the arts are self-employed. When you think about it, poets, writers, actors, dancers, musicians are are all business people. They run a business of making art. So my first question to you is, why a book about self-employment and survival strategies, and why write it now? Well, there's been phenomenal growth in self-employment, and by the year uh, 2027, it's projected that a full 50% of the workforce in America will be self-employed in one way or another. So with, with self-employment growing at three times the rate of the overall uh, uh, employment in America, this seems like a good time. Also, I'm nearing the end of my career after almost 30 years of self-employment, and I just felt I had some things that I had learned along the way that would help people. When, when somebody decides they're going to be an artist and they have the creative talent or they're going to be a dancer or a musician or a poet um one of the most important business strategies someone who's self-employed needs to know when they're going to go off and do it well when in in getting ready for this interview i recalled a uh, piece that had been appeared on my blog uh, succeeding in small business.com you and I both do profiles on that blog of people who have succeeded as small business. And the very, very first one of those that I had done was of Ann Brower, who's a quilter extraordinaire who lives in, um, in um, Shelburne Falls. She makes some of the most beautiful quilts I've ever seen. She often takes commissions from people. And she talks about how in this uh, Q&A about how she succeeded, about how that the business part of her business was the, the hard part for her to learn. She needed to learn about markets, where she could sell. She needed to learn how to listen to her clients and really find out what they wanted. She said her first instinct was, some, was, was somebody would describe a quilt that they wanted, and she wasn't artistically interested in, in doing what they wanted. But she found that if she engaged them in a conversation, she could work with them and get around to a point where she thought it would meet her artistic integrity needs and, and that sort of thing. But she talks about how she had to learn a whole lot about the business side of, of being an artist. And I think there are many artists out there who are fantastic at what they do, and actors and musicians who are fantastic at what they do. But where is it that they have gone to get this training about the business side? They probably haven't. If you went to theater school like you did, you, did they ever talk to you about the business side, Mark? Well, they actually did, but it okay. was um, very, very basic. It was like you need to have a headshot, a photo headshot, if you're going to go to an audition. Or right. um, you, you should have a resume and you should list in this way the roles that you've played. But... Nothing was mentioned about health plans and how to look after yourself, and nothing was mentioned about how to go out and market yourself. And when the money came in, nobody talked to you about whether you put it in a checking account or a savings account and which bills to pay first. I mean, you sort of learn that on the street, as they say. I think right. things have changed now. Um, there are programs, for example, at let's say, at the University of Massachusetts, the Arts Extension Service, which will teach some very basic finance, marketing, development, fundraising skills to artists or people that are running arts organizations. But that's sort of a recent thing. It hasn't been around in the business for a long time. Right, right. People need to know where they can go to get that kind of uh, knowledge, and I'm glad that the uh, UMass is doing that. Also, all of the, um, the community colleges have, uh, most of them have small business development centers, and you can go there and get some very excellent training in the things that you need to know, like marketing, like how to use social media. Social media is such a huge thing that artists particularly can use, uh, particularly visual artists, painters, sculptors, 
people like Ann Brower, who does the quilts and potters and so forth, think about what Instagram, for example, is just one of the social media can mean to, to people like that. But you have to know how to use it correctly. Yeah, and for example, if you're an, a visual artist, you might have a website or use Instagram or Facebook to show uh, photographs of your work, your sculpture, your paintings, your quilts, if you're a quilter. And if you're a musician, you might have um, little sound bites of some of the music you're working on. And certainly, if you're in a videographer or a filmmaker, you'll have clips of some of the movies and, and stuff like that. So having a good website and utilizing social media to its max is really, really important. And um, there are ways to learn how to do it. There are places to go to learn. But also, um, if you're really savvy at your art and you start to have a cash flow, there are people you can hire to do that kind of work for you. And um, I think that I may be wrong, Jean, but I think everybody should have a basic bookkeeping skill so they know how to deposit a check and how to pay their bills. But when it comes time to do taxes, most people will go to a tax expert. Um, so why not go to a, a good bookkeeper at the same time and invest a little bit of money there if you're self-employed or um, to a financial planner? I think artists in particular, perhaps more than even the rest of us, um, don't want to take time away from doing their art to take care of those things. And I have a friend who's a great artist and um, graphic designer in Boston, and at one point, he, he had a very, very successful graphic design firm, but he was literally, and I mean this literally, keeping his receipts for expenses and so forth in a shoebox. I know that's a cliche, but that's actually what my friend was doing. And unfortunately, he got in trouble with the tax man because he wasn't keeping things totally accurate and so forth, and that took him years to clean up. So you, you, you may not want to take time away from your art to focus on what seems to you a very mundane and boring activity, keeping track of your expenses, the money that you spend out um, on your art, or the money that's coming in, although hopefully that's not quite as boring. Who doesn't? I love to send out invoices, and I love to get the checks. I'm sure you do too, Mark. Oh, I love going to the bank. I mean, it's just, it's yeah. it's always a feel-good thing to put the money in when you right. look at the, at the bottom line and you don't have the money to write the checks to pay for everything, then it's a whole different feeling. Right, exactly. What but is, you, have to, you have to spend time on the business side in order for that to come uh, into its own and, and in order to succeed. You can't just sit around and um, make a lot of art and think that people will just miraculously come to you. You have to learn to market yourself, find out where you can go, who you can talk to, network, network, network. Networking is extremely important. What are some of the things that people can learn from your book? Well, I think it's things like you, you and I have been talking about, um, I have strategies in there that have proven to be successful for me over the years. And then there are seven people, including yourself, who are also in the book, who, have given, who are giving advice. Uh, we talk about the money aspect of it. You brought up something very important a while ago that I think artists in general uh, t might tend to overlook, which is someday you're going to retire. Now, maybe you will never give up your art Totally, but at some point you'll need to slow down probably, um, unless you're going to, as they say, die with your boots on. But you need to, to look at those things, and, and maybe you want to set aside some money so that you can travel later in life and that sort of thing. So you need to learn how to do that, um, how to plan for retirement, how to plan one big thing you and I both have faced is health issues. Uh, people don't think about that particularly when they're young artists and they're just starting out, something may go wrong. Uh, you and I have both suffered from vision issues and have had to have eye surgery, which as writers could have put us out of business. So you have to make sure you have the proper insurance in place, all that type of thing, to help you through... Um, emergencies like that. Yeah, that's and something, then, that's it, something uh, that people in the arts don't think about that often. Right. But if you're a dancer 
a, a yeah. particularly a ballet dancer, your career could technically be over due to one slip on a, during a performance or one fall or one broken foot. And maybe the dance company that you're dancing with has a good health plan that'll take care of that specific injury. But what happens if you come to the point where they say, well, you need physical therapy for the next eight months and you won't be able to dance? And if you can't dance, you can't bring in a paycheck. Or what happens if you're a musician and you play the trumpet or the trombone or the tuba and you're in a car accident and it does something to your teeth? Um, I had a friend who was a trumpet player who was in a car accident and uh, had a couple of teeth knocked out. It changed the timbre and the tone of their playing until their teeth were fixed. Where does the money come from? What do you do? So these are things to think about. And there are strategies as self-employed people to find health insurance. as, And sometimes it's really expensive, but sometimes with some good forethought and some planning, it's there. Um, what do you do if you can't do your art anymore? Uh, where do you turn? Um, how much money do you put away? Uh, do you create a painting or a sculpture on speculation? Or do you, if somebody says, I need a mural that's five foot by 10 feet for my living room and I need it in these colors and you're going to create something specific, how much money do you ask for up front? These are all self-employment survival strategies. And I, I think from reading the book, Gene, there's a lot of it in there that applies to non-arts and non-creative economy type of people. But there's so much that can be called for the arts and the uh, creative economy specifically. Well, Mark, when you when you talk about um, somebody asking you to do a mural and so forth, the thing that comes to my mind is also something that we that I talk about in the book which is knowing what your personal values are. Artists like to think that they have artistic integrity. So how much, if you're in a tough spot, your cash flow is not what you want it to be and so forth, how much are you willing to bend to do something that maybe wouldn't be your first choice to do, but it's got to have your name on it? So how do, how do you make those decisions? Have you run into artists who are dealing with that type of thing? I have. Um, I mean, there are times, where, and you know this from being a writer, as I do from being a writer, Well, somebody asks you to do something and it's not something that you really feel you should be doing, but you need the money and you, you kind of leap off of the path that you are best known and most comfortable in to pursue something that might be a challenge to you. For example, no, nobody in their right mind should ask me as a reporter to cover science. I'm an arts reporter. And yet people will ask me, could you do this or could you try that? And you have to know what your comfort level is. I mean, I would feel, I think you'd probably feel pretty much the same way, right? Right. I mean, if somebody asked me to write about sports, yeah, I follow sports, but I don't know the intricacies and so forth, so I can't write about that. Also, once I started writing, ghostwriting business books, I started getting requests from people wanting to me to, wanting to, me to edit all sorts of other books, like memoirs, um, fiction novels, and so forth. I'm not skilled at that. Um, I read a ton of novels, but I've just never put myself out there as somebody who could do that. So what I do is try to find them, somebody else, send them somewhere, uh, like to the writer's union, where they might be able to find somebody who has experience in that and would do a better job for them and not just take their money. Well, Jim, we only have a couple of seconds left here. And first of all, I wanted to reiterate, the book comes out on April 8th. And how can people pre-order it? It's available for pre-order on Amazon and on Barnes & Noble online and on millions of books online. And so if you want to learn more about the book, they could go to succeedinginsmallbusiness.com, and there's a link right on the homepage that will take them to a page that will tell them more about the book and its content. And, the and they could also download the first chapter for free. 
Well, that's great. The other thing we should tell people is you'll be on, uh, swinging through New England on a book tour in June. And you on, I believe it's Saturday, June 21st, you'll be stopping by the Blue Umbrella Bookstore just down the street from us in downtown Westfield to chat about the book and uh, meet people and you, uh, folks that are listeners have a chance to ask Gene some questions that you might have about how do you succeed um, in, in being self-employed and what survival strategies do you need to know? Uh, Jean, when you come up here in June, can you bring some warmer weather for us? I hope so. I'll, I'll be very disappointed if it's still snowing there when I get there in June. Well, we're going to do our best to, to kind of fast track into summer when you get here. We've been okay. talking with Jean Yoakum. Thanks for joining us. Uh, her new book, The Self-Employment Survival Guide, is coming out on April 8th. And uh, you can pick up a copy of it by going to her blog, Succeeding in Small Business. When we come back, we'll be talking with Meredith Atkinson from Playhouse on Park in West Hartford. It's a theater company I'm not very much aware of yet, but I've learned some very interesting things about. This is Arts Beat Radio. I'm Mark Auerbach with Peter Coles here in the studio at 89.5 FM WSKB on the Westfield State University campus, and we'll be right back. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Westfield Bank. For more than 160 years, Westfield Bank has been an important community presence and commercial leader in the Pioneer Valley. With convenient full banking services in Westfield, West Springfield, East Longmeadow, Agawam, Feeding Hills, Springfield, Southwick, as well as Enfield and Granby, Connecticut, visit us on the web at westfieldbank.org. Support for community programming on WSKB is provided by Betts Plumbing and Heating Supply Company, an independent, family-owned wholesaler serving Westfield for over 50 years. Specializing in plumbing, heating, and industrial piping supplies. Visit BetsPlumbing.com or 14 Coleman Avenue, Westfield. Public welcome. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Barnes & Noble College Bookstore at Westfield State University, right here in the Ely Campus Center. Whether you're a student, faculty member, or friend of the university, it's the place to shop. Everything from Westfield State t-shirts, sweatshirts, and gift merchandise to all of your academic needs. Offering textbook materials in new, used, ebook, and rental formats. Visit the bookstore on campus or online at www.westfieldstate.bncollege.com. We thank the generosity of our underwriters. For more information, please contact the Westfield State Foundation at 413-572-8646. Thursday morning from 6 till 8, it's Patrick Berry owner of the Westfield News Group, Community Radio, 89.5 WSKB. Live from the campus of Westfield State University, this is 89.5 FM, WSKB, Westfield. Welcome back, everyone. This is Mark Auerbach with Arts Beat Radio. I'll be standing in tomorrow on the Westfield News Show for Patrick Berry. And for the entire two hours from 6 to 8, we'll be talking with folks from the Berkshire Theatre Group who are about to celebrate their 90th season, which in the world of theatre is quite a milestone. And uh, Kate McGuire, who's the CEO of the Berkshire Theatre Group, will be joining us along with director Travis Daly, who will be staging... Tarzan this summer at the Colonial Theater and Daisy Walker, their director, who's going to stage a revival of the Age of Aquarius musical Hair. And um, I had fun picking out musical segments for tomorrow's show. So I hope you'll you'll join us tomorrow. And our next Arts Beat Radio will be on Wednesday, April 18th. Paul Marte from the Bushnell is going to talk about the upcoming Broadway series there, which includes Hamilton. It's a musical we've all been waiting to see. We'll be talking with Chris Roman, who is the theater writer for The Valley Advocate, who also directs plays. And he's directing a world premiere of a new musical based on the Moliere comedy Tartuffe, and that's happening at the Silverthorne Theater up in Greenfield. And also on that program, Ilona Samagi, who's the costume designer for the Will Rogers Follies, which opens the Good Speed musical season. But here now on the phone, Meredith Atkinson from Playhouse and Park in West Hartford. How are you, Meredith? 
I'm well. How are you, Mark? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, you guys have had a really great year, and uh, it's, it keeps going with one new show after another. And next up is a play by uh, called The Revisionist by Jesse Eisenberg. And it's Jesse Eisenberg, the actor, right, who wrote the play? Yes, yes. Um, you may know him from uh, The Social Network. Um, also some indie movies, uh, Zombieland, I think is one of them, but he's also, um, contributor to the New Yorker as well. Um, and this is his play. Um, it is actually the New England premiere of this play. We're very proud, very excited for that. Um, our cast arrived yesterday, um, and they're already fabulous, got in on a, a rehearsal. So yeah, that's coming up. We open on uh, April 11th. And what, what is the season... Afterwards, I mean, you go right into the summer, correct? We do. Um, we um, round things off with um, In the Heights, um, and that finishes on July 29th. That opens on uh, June 13th That's um, by a playwright. I don't know. Some of your listeners might have heard of him. His name is Lynn manuel Miranda. You know, he has a yeah, little show. Yeah, he, he wrote that American History <laughs> musical that people are lining up at the Bushnell for, and it doesn't come yeah. until December. Exactly. Um, but yeah, that um, In the Heights runs the 13th of June through July 29th, and then we do take um, take the month of August, and we open usually the first or second week in um, September with our um, our 10th season this year. So very excited about that. Tell me a little bit about Playhouse on Park and how it came to be. So we, um, we are, like I said, we'll be um, in our 10th season next year. And we are a uh, nonprofit professional theater. So um, to translate for your listeners, we um, we employ equity actors from um, around the country. Um, but we also hire locally as well. Um, we run auditions in both New York City and uh, Connecticut. Uh, we also have, there's always something going on. The lights are never off here, ever, ever. Um, we also have an education department as well um, for um, young actors. Um, we have comedy nights. Uh, we bring in a couple of stand-up comedians, um, usually a BYOB. That's always a good time. Um, and um, what our major draw is the main stage series, um, which is a uh, seven show strong. Um, always um, a dance show in that run uh, with our original, um, excuse me, our uh, resident dance company. Um, two musicals and the rest are dramas. Um, what a lot of people here have never been to Playhouse on Park, and I know it's in West Hartford. Um, where is it? Can you park there? Places to eat nearby? It's it's in the heart of West Hartford, correct? Yes, correct. So we're we are on Park Road. Um, the area is awesome. There are a lot of great um, small, independently owned businesses from. Um, gardening stores to um, cocktail bars to restaurants. Um, it's a really, really lovely area, and it's um, really accessible, too. Um, we actually are neighbors with A.C. Peterson um, Ice Cream Shop, so that's always a nice little spot. Um, it's a That's a landmark here in West Hartford, so a lot of people know if you know where the ice cream place is, and we're right next door. Um, parking is very easy, too. Um, we're very accessible to, uh, to the public. Um, going back to the next play, The Revisionist by Jesse Eisenberg, uh, what is it about? Is it a comedy, a drama? And um, it is the New England premiere. Where had the show been before? Um, it was featured off-Broadway. Um, and it was um, it was brought here because my, um, my two artistic directors, um, Sean Harris and Darlene Zoller, um, had a really, they had a really deep connection with it. It's a comedic drama, and it, um, it features um, a young science fiction writer named David who experiences writer's block. And he, um, he knows that he has um, a long-lost relative in Poland um, who... Um, is opening up her home to him. And so he figures if he can get away, work through his writer's block, and just take time off, then he'll be all set. And um, it's really a beautiful story about um, 
family about um, unexpected connections because he's there for all business and to kind of focus on his career, and all she wants to do is connect with him. So it's a really beautiful story about um, kind of what it means to be a family, what it means to connect with somebody, and um, it also speaks a lot to kind of our day and age where everybody's face is in their phone and nobody really wants to. Everybody wants to connect with each other, but on, like, the face-to-face level, sometimes we don't. It's a really awesome story. How did you get involved in theater? Um, I actually um, started um, started back up with um, with a dance, a tap class here locally. I needed to have some sort of outlet as a dancer, and I um, I met our co artistic uh, director Darlene Solar, who is my tap teacher, and we um, it kind of went from there. Um, an opening happened at the theater here and um, marketing is in my background so that's kind of how I got into the theater scene. so you came to the theater from the world of dance yes yeah. yeah and 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 you do have a resident dance company that performs uh, every year uh, stop time I think is the name of it correct yes yeah we're actually in the middle of our run right now it's going really well um, five shows remain and they're all nearly sold out Um we are celebrating our 15th year. Um, we began um, not here at the theater, since the theater's um, Playhouse on Park has only been in existence for about nine years. But we, um, Darlene started the dance company and did some shows in the local area. And then when she found out that the theater was for sale, the rest was history. And we've been the resident dance company ever since. Now, working in theater, but coming from the world of dance, some of this theater is maybe new to you. Has there been a particular play or musical that Playhouse on Park has done that personally impacted you and you said this has made you really glad that you work in theater? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think two stand out to me at this point. Um Last year, we um, ran Title of Show, um, which was a great, cheeky comedy about, um, it's a play about writing a play, kind of very meta. I I just, I loved that. Um, And that was also, it also kind of touched on, you know, what it is to, to finish college and figure out what to do after that. And it was, I just thought it was a fabulous musical. Um, and then our last show, Intimate Apparel, was really beautiful, um, written by a Pulitzer Prize winner, Lynn Nottage. It was something I wasn't really fami- familiar with, but um, it's a really, really beautiful and powerful story about um, love and life and loss and grief. And, yeah, so those, those two really stand out to me. Do you get a chance uh, to see what other theaters are doing? Now? And uh, do you, when you go to a place somewhere else now, do you see it in a different light? I do, yeah. I'm always kind of, um, when I do go, I'm always looking at the a lot of the technical things, and I'm always kind of just looking at the behind the scenes. Of course, I'm looking at the production and, and the play and trying to focus on that. But I also, um, it's hard not to to look around and just watch to see how the place operates and just how it comes to life in that respect. Um, I recently saw um, Constellations over at Theater Works, and that was, that was beautiful. Yeah, I, th- I think we're very lucky in this area, um, partic- in Hartford, Springfield, Westfield area, to have so many theaters doing such interesting stuff. I mean, every time you look to see what's on the calendar for the weekend, there's really a diverse set of offerings. And certainly Playhouse on Park is, is a major contributor to that. Yeah, we, we truly believe so as well. And um, we have also been, we've been recognized by the um, Connecticut Critics Circle, which has been a real honor to us. Um, and we've had visits from the Times as well. And we are so, so happy to be a part of this theater scene here that is, certainly thriving and really has a lot to offer. To, uh, well, we should probably interrupt here because people are probably saying, well, how do I find out more information about <laughs> Play Hassan Park? So how can they find out about the rest of the season, either by phone, by email, website, or whatever? So um, 
if you want to talk to one of our um, friendly box office representatives, we can be reached at um, 860-523-5900, extension 10. Um, we're always here to talk um, or, you know, sell you tickets. Um, our website is playhouseonpark.org. And we can also be found on Twitter and Instagram at Playhouse on Park and on Facebook as well at Playhouse on Park Theater. So there's no excuse for somebody uh, who's listening to this show this morning to not be able to find you. You guys are all over social media. Yes. And we probably have, we have a couple of minutes left. We probably should talk about In the Heights because I, I, I bet that's going to sell out uh, way in advance. It is. It's selling very strong already. Um, both of our previews, I believe, are nearly sold out. Um, we still have some tickets for opening night, which is always a very exciting night. Love that. Um, we do a, um, a nice cocktail reception beforehand, which is very fun. Um, but, yeah, it's also it's, it's selling strongly. Um, I think it has, obviously, it has a playwright going for it. Um, and it also has our directing team of Sean Harris and Darlene Zoller as well, um, People who are familiar with us may remember um, they directed Hair, Chorus Line, um, Cabaret in the past, and they're just a, an awesome dynamic duo. And it's a Tony Award winning musical by Lynn Manuel Miranda, who is probably best known now for this small musical uh, hit in New York called Hamilton. Yeah. Have yeah. you seen Hamilton? I have not. I can't. I can't wait till it comes to Hartford. I um, have tried several times to get tickets in New York, and there's always a line around the block. <laughs> so uh, this guy is so mega talented, and I yeah. I love the music to In the Heights. I've heard the uh, original cast recording several times. I got a chance to see it once on tour. I think people will be totally uplifted by it and want to dance in the aisles. Oh yeah, that and we. We um, we're hoping that for in the in the heights as well, <laughs> which would be awesome. Um, so if you're not actually, you know, to build off of that, if you're not familiar, or if your listeners aren't familiar with the theater, it is very intimate. We see 166, and we will be dancing in the aisles, and we hope they'll get us. <laughs> and you're going to guarantee the dancing in the aisles. Yeah. Okay, so give me a quick wrap up of what's coming between now and summer. Between now and the summer, we've got um, The Revisionist, as we were talking about earlier, Jesse Eisenberg's comedic drama, uh, April 11th through 29th. Um, Also not to be missed is our um, Theater for Young Audience series. Um, We we employ um, professional actors to do um, children's musicals and dramas, and the next one coming up is Polka Dots, the Cool Kids musical. Um, It is uh, written by Douglas Lyons who is a University of Hartford um, school graduate. And um, it's a really awesome story about um, celebrating differences, and um, that runs May 12th through the 20th. We also offer for that show um, special um, sensory-friendly shows for children who have um, needs as far as um, autism and special needs like that as well. And then finally, we have um, In the Heights, June 13th through July 29th, which is... Well, I'm really look, I'm looking forward to all of those, uh, in particular in the Heights. And when Arts Beat Radio goes back to a weekly format at the end of May and throughout the summer, Meredith, I hope you'll come back and chat with us again. Maybe share something during the summer about the upcoming season after in the Heights. I would love that. And yeah, we're, when, um, we're it, on the brink of actually... Um, announcing next season which is exciting too when when do you think we'll know what's coming next year um i want to say um expect to hear some rumblings um maybe by april 1st or when the snow melts exactly well i don't know about that because we (laughs) might that might be it might be longer than that so let's just say 
April 1st. It might be because we're going to have a snowstorm today, and who knows what's scheduled snow-wise for next Wednesday uh, when we get (laughs) our next snow day. Meredith Atkinson from Playhouse on Park, thanks for joining us this morning here on Arts Beat Radio. And again, playhouseonpark.org for information on the Revisionist in the Heights and all of their other plays and uh, dance performances coming. Thanks for being here this morning. Thank you, Mark. Don't forget to join us tomorrow on the Westfield News Show when we spend two hours talking with the good folks from the Berkshire Theater Group. And then on April 18th, when the next edition of Arts Beat Radio shows up with Paul Marte from the Bushnell and uh, Chris Roman directing Tartuffe for Silverthorne Theater and Alona Samagi who is the costumer for the Will Rogers Follies which opens the good speed season. I'm Mark Auerbach in the studio with Peter Coles. Thanks for joining us on another edition of Arts Beat Radio.